Now then, I'm delighted to welcome to the show today Leah McGrath Goodman, who is an author and journalist, and who is a journalist um, perhaps most recently well known for having been compromised, shall we say, by the British authorities by having her visa taken away when she was doing her job essentially as a journalist, which was investigating a particular story and a story that happened to be surrounding the scandal of the care homes in Jersey, the care home Haute de la Guerin. Good afternoon. Leah, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Very, very good. Very happy to have you on the show today. I appreciate your time very much. And I'd like you, Leah, please to start by telling the story from the the point at which you actually became involved in looking into Jersey, into the Haute de la Garenne um, care home scandal. Well, I have friends on the island, and it came from living in London and visiting the island and just you know, getting an attachment really to the place and a fondness for the people there. And uh, a few years into my familiarity with the island, the scandal of Hot de la Garen took place, uh, the investigation into the extent to which children had been abused there, um, and perhaps it seems uh, also tortured, and there are allegations as well as murder. So I became very interested at that point in uh, not just the investigation itself and how it unfolded, but also the way it looked to me that the islanders were dealing with it, which some of those aspects seem to me to be very unusual. Well, that's an interesting point, and perhaps even more interesting, the fact that you, as a, a non-Brit, as a, an outsider looking into um, an island like Jersey, so as an American observer, what did you perceive there on that island? Well, I, I, I think, frankly, it was a clearly very upsetting scandal to have surface, and there were rumors on the island, according to the people I know there, for a long time before it all came to the surface. So it was, I think, very upsetting for a lot of people. And the way the investigation was handled felt to many to be very chaotic. Uh, I don't think that it was the fault as much of the officers in charge as it was of those above them and their fear about what was going to be found. So there was a lot of, it seemed behind the scenes, a lot of fighting um, about how things would be proceeding. And as we know, it didn't end very well. And uh, I was just very surprised that the press and many of the islanders seemed to sort of shrug and move on afterward instead of finding it to be uh, probably not um, left in the way it should have been. Right. Well, let, let's just go back. I mean, anybody who's not aware of how Jersey is run, I think you've referred to it as a banana republic, and pretty much it is. I mean, it has uh, a government as such, but it has no political parties. So, I mean, it, it really is a sort of um, a single state um, institution, isn't it, with nobody to answer to? Well, I have to say, I would not say banana republic because I don't want to be unkind, but I do want to say that uh, the way it operates, because it's so small, uh, you know, the individuals in the government, uh, they have their own opinions. So they have the, you know, they have backbenchers just like they have in members of parliament in England. And then they have sort of the mainstream um, legislators. And a lot of that almost functions as if it's multiple parties. You know, they'll have their own factions, but they're not parties per se. So there are similar functions amongst the people in the government. The biggest problem, I think, is that because it's such a small leadership, there's a lot of opportunity for conflicts of interest and for people to protect each other and look out for each other's interests in a much more intense way than you get in a larger government. Now, it was in 2008 that um, the, uh, the care home started to be excavated, essentially. I mean, literally, the, the foundations dug out and the horrendous findings of, um, of skulls and bones and so on. Um, during that time, you were actually on the island. You were speaking to the, the local people. I cur t Tell me, I mean, was there a feeling that um, people on the island had known that there was something going on within that care home? Yes, I, a little bit of both, to be honest. There was, there were people who said I had a wife who was a cleaning lady there uh, and she never saw a thing and I can't believe this happened. And other people who said that they had seen and heard things that had been disturbing them for many years. So it does seem that some people were in the know, some people were not. Um, and that some of what went on was quite private, quite secret. What and in two thousand and eight, what was the the tipping point, if you like, that um, the the children's home was investigated and excavated? What was it that made the authorities now start to look more deeply in there? 
Uh, it's interesting. The health minister at the time, Stuart Seabray, he had been looking at strands of what had been accounts, stories from victims. And he said the more he looked at it, the worse it looked. He said, you know, first it was a few things and then it's just it was unbelievable. It just seemed to be limitless. And he was doing that at the same time the police were putting together similar pieces. And it just, it was probably, they, they weren't speaking to one another according to both the police and the health minister, Stuart Seabray. Um, but they certainly came to similar conclusions right around the same time. And that really was the tipping point um, when they decided to dig under the school. Uh, that was the school, the children's home. It was, it was many things, but it was really mm -hmm. mostly an orphanage uh, for children. Um, and at the time they found out about each other's efforts. And so it all came together, but you know, these people were very focused on getting to the bottom of it. And I think that they have been made to suffer because they did not want the victims to be railroaded and they did not want the truth to be subterfuged. And I believe that's probably what happened. What the, the health minister um, of the Jersey government, the, the health minister of Jersey, um, would he have received um, some kind of confrontation from his peers? Uh, when you say he would have received, you mean, I'm sorry? I mean, did he, did he receive, um, w was he seen to be opening a can of worms that um, he was encouraged not to take any further, considering he was peers with the people who were um, allegedly implicated in trying to cover up this story for years? Well, it's interesting. If you look at all the coverage at the time, you can see, you know, Stuart Seavery standing beside the chief minister for the island and... You know, there was this united front in the beginning where both the police force as well as the health minister were being told, you know, you're supported. We want you to find out what happened. Let's get to the bottom of this. And as it began to look pretty bad, it it turned the other way. And you could see that the, that they started falling out. So Stuart Seavery fell out. The, um, the police involved in the investigation, the two top people involved, they were falling out. All of them. Uh, you know, the, the policemen involved left the island um, and Stuart Seavery was sacked as health minister. Right. And all three of those people from the, the deputy who was in charge of the investigation to the chief of police to Stuart, the health minister, they all still very strongly believe that justice was not done. They were not allowed to do their jobs. They were heavily interfered with. And um, they have been very much um, isolated as a result of not changing their minds about what took place. What, what, where are we at with that investigation? I mean, is it a, a closed case or is it just, um, why is it quiet now? Yes, they quickly shut down Operation Rectangle after the chief of police was suspended twice. He was suspended uh, amid uh, allegations that he had overspent, he'd gone over budget, that the budget was out of control. Um, he was told money is no object, let's get to the bottom of it. But they decided uh, the leadership change their minds. And he was, uh, he went, he's retired now, quite frankly, he's not even on the island anymore, as is uh, the deputy who was in charge of the investigation. They're both not on the mainland. They both left in fear, which is not really the way you should be retiring. And Stuart Seabury is still there. Those who are still fighting for the rights of the victims are all in fear. And I don't think if you're looking to, uh, support victims' rights, you should have to be fearful for yourself. But that is how those people feel. Do you have any idea, Leah, of figures of um, victims uh, still alive today who've come forward and, and given evidence of some kind? Yes, just under 200 people came forward to give testimony about uh, Hatzala Garan. And uh, many of them can still very clearly tell their stories. And they are very upset every time this thing comes up. I mean, to hear this radio broadcast would probably bring them very much pain mm -hmm. because every time they have hope, of justice, but they also remember all the times that they haven't had any justice, and it's very painful for them. Um, it's really kind of torture for them. And the um, t to what extent are we to um, understand that the the victims have been? Um, uh, I mean, are, are there any victims who have? Um, in a similar way, Stephen Mesher, who who was um, a victim of uh, abuse here in a care home in the UK, he was very much um, 
uh, bastardized, if you like, by the UK media and um, indicated to be uh, an, an imbecile, perhaps somebody who wasn't capable of um, giving valid, valid evidence. And of course, you know, as one commentator I had on my program said, well, you know, the, the, after what the guy's been through, of course, he's perhaps going to appear nervous and a little bit jumpy and so on. You know, he's lived his life with these memories. Do we, ha did we have a similar uh, kind of response by the media in Jersey to, to the victims coming? forward? Yeah, I don't think uh, there's enough uh, compassion for the victims and an interest in telling their stories and making sure that, that this is done in a balanced way. Uh, I think most of the victims feel very much neglected and alone. And uh, of course, that is not what you would want them to feel like. Uh, one of the difficult things as someone researching this is having to watch, you know, all sides as it unfolds. And there is a committee of inquiry right now that will be voted on this month in Jersey to look back and say, did we do the right things in this investigation? And there's been such a clamor over the what, what is called the terms of reference for this committee of inquiry, uh, where they had terms of reference that had made the victims feel that they were correctly addressing it. And those terms were scuttled and whitewashed without asking the victims their opinion. And when they protested, the local newspaper, the Jersey Evening Post, put out an editorial saying it's clear that certainly no kind of inquiry could ever really make the victims feel better. You know, it's impossible to, to satisfy them mm. as if they are, you know, as if they cannot be pleased no matter what. Mm. They had already said that they were happy with the, the current terms and they were changed. So the paper, of course, completely ignored that part. And th there's this unfortunate way of putting out a story that's not even the real story it's happening over and over again it's mm. infuriating to watch because they're really victimizing these victims all over again mm. and it's unconscionable i i cannot say how difficult it is to see what are otherwise i think probably ordinary or decent human beings doing with these people Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You know, if, if uh, we can't protect our children, then um, our society really has to has to, a lot to answer for. And we're talking about um, Haute La Garenne and uh, Richmond, Co Richmond Council and Elm House. Obviously, the, those victims are now adults, but there's sufficient evidence if one um, looks deeply enough to understand that there are children being abused as we speak. And this is one reason why this story has to be um, has to be prioritized prioritized and uh, looked at continually until we've got to the bottom of how these uh, historic cases have have been able to uh, be allowed to take place and historic you know that word is a bit um, it, it, it can be a bit of a blockage towards actually moving forward because uh, the public not wanting to believe that this could possibly have been true um, can quite um, conveniently can't compartmentalize these situations as historic and that okay well it, uh, it was very terrible what happened but it's in the past but it's not in the past I'm fairly sure of that and and um, I'm sure you are too would you in your yeah. opinion uh, Leah um, th theoretically would you imagine that there could be a link between Holt La Garen Richmond Council and Elm House I think, I, I mean, I can't say that I know that some of these things are directly linked, but I do think that unfortunately, until attitudes change about apprehending child abuse in the UK, I mean, look at all the very prominent names that exactly. have been outed, they're mm -hmm. dead. So if you're prominent, you have to be dead for people to find out what you've been doing. And if you're not prominent, then they might bring you in, um, but they're going to make sure it's only little guys. So the, there is no there's no reason for me to be convinced that prominent people involved are not still um, being protected. And the fact that someone would use the word historic in front of the word child abuse, uh, I've never heard of him, somebody say, you know, a rape that happened to somebody's daughter 10 or 20 years ago. It's a historic rape or a historic murder. Yes, great point. Yeah. Who says that? Nobody. Yeah. Why would we say historic child abuse? Why don't we just say child abuse? Yeah. It is offensive. And I am not someone who's ever gone through what these poor people must have gone through, but I feel strongly protective of them as a citizen of the world, that we can't allow this kind of thing to happen to anybody, whether they're in England or whether they're here in the US and it happens here too. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to look out for those who are more vulnerable. And if they seem nervous because they've been through so much, how dare you judge them? Yes. 
Absolutely. Leah, and, that, and that's a great point because uh, that brings us now to your story. I mean, you've been incredibly brave and uh, uh, wonderfully um, determined to find out what you can and to, to do what you can to expose this story. So tell us what happened to you. There was a point where you'd left the UK and gone back to America. And when you were due to come back, you were stopped on your re-entry into the UK. Uh, yes, uh, that did happen. And I had been on the island of Jersey arranging a flat in an office um, under the foreigner um, terms to do that, meaning not living there, but just having a place to be when I was doing my research. And I had to come back to the U.S. And when I returned, I found myself uh, blocked, more or less. Um, I was passing through London on the way to speak at a bank conference in Austria. It was September 2011. And I was locked up by border officials at Heathrow Airport. Um, they did not tell me they were going to lock me up. They asked if they could ask some questions. I was brought into a room, shut the door, locked. I was there for 12 hours in a search and seizure action. At no time was I told why. They went through all of my things. It was like they didn't have a reason, but they were going to find some reason. Um, and they grilled me about my work in Jersey. Um, I showed them my onward flight booking to Austria. They did not care. They said, we think you want to live in Jersey. We think you might want to overstay your visa. Um, I had never even come close to overstaying a visa. Um, I have spent, the longest I've ever spent on any visa was five weeks on a six-month visa. Mm -hmm. So you're not grazing close to the edge there. Um, it was clearly just a trumped up thing. And after 12 hours, uh, they said that they felt that I was being deceptive because I told them I was going to Austria and I wasn't going to live in Jersey. Um, the whole thing about living in Jersey, I don't, I mean, it was just something to say. Um, it, they can accuse you of whatever they want and then say that if you don't uh, admit to it, that you're deceptive. So that's what they did. But an illegal um, detention nonetheless. Yeah, it was a de facto arrest on no grounds. So I had no, there were no grounds for doing it. It was illegal. Um, and in addition, they didn't let me call my consulate. I wasn't allowed representation, not a solicitor, not a lawyer. And I couldn't even tell my family where I was. So for 12 hours, I disappeared off the face of the earth and no one was allowed to know what happened to me. And that is what frightens me the most about going back and investigating this, that England will do that and that Jersey would authorize doing that. Um, if they'll do it for 12 hours, I don't know if they can't do it for much longer. So from that point, you, you had, I believe it's a period of 500 days where you've been denied a visa to re-enter into the United Kingdom. That has just recently been overturned and you've, um, you've, uh, yeah. now, you now have a, a UK visa back. You are allowed to come back and work in the UK. Um, yes, and Jersey has tried to say that uh, the reason for a 500-day ban was because my original visa, which was a business visitor's visa, which is what journalists typically use, and I have used all my career when I travel abroad, that that was inappropriate for whatever reason. I have no idea because they still allow writers to come in on a business visitor's visa, but in that case, they had simply changed your mind when it came to me. Um, but that is their disingenuous explanation that um, I shouldn't have been there on a business visitor's visa, and that I needed to have this long-term kind of visa, which I finally have now. Um, and in addition, uh, they have they have actually, the local paper has still put in articles and the Jersey Evening Post still says, Leah claims she was banned, as if this hasn't been verified everywhere mm. at this point and that they couldn't just call their immigration authority and ask. So they try to act like all of this is kind of a fairy story, which is amazing. Um, and that is, uh, again, uh, a problem on this island is that its own media tries to misinform its own public. Uh, Leah, I'm not going to ask you to, to divulge what your plans are, but hypothetical question. How, dif how difficult would it be for you to um, reinitiate your investigations into the, the Jersey Care Home scandal? Well, I think that because the island has reacted you know, very harshly to the idea of my coming back to do this investigation. Um, of course, there are going to be difficulties. And there's a lot of support on the island for this work. Um, but a lot of those people feel they have to stay silent. Um, they write letters to me quite frequently. But I think that they feel that they will be attacked if they speak publicly very much. And so that tells me that uh, the people who do not want this investigated right now still have the upper hand. Um, and that is very unfortunate. 
And I, I mean, certainly you'd be very aware of what's happening on the mainland in the UK as well, and there's some uh, terrible situations there as well. Um, uh, and again, and many people many feeling that the authorities have the upper hand and it's going to be a long, hard road to actually get to the bottom of these um, horrifying stories and actually bring the people to justice who are guilty of, of perpetrating these horrific crimes. Do you, um, are you optimistic? Do you see a day when hopefully um, this will be brought, these will all be brought to justice? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I think honestly, that uh, the goal here is to sort the fact from the fiction about what happened, um, to talk to the victims, to talk to everyone involved, and to find, you know, there's going to be some things we'll never be able to find out. You know, maybe at one time we could have, and it's too late now, but there's still some things that we can find out for sure, and things that we'll know we'll never know. And also, we're going to have things that um, are being actively hidden. So for example, there's evidence that you know, we can't locate and people who will not provide it or even tell us where it is. So if we can get to the bottom of things like, well, what are we being told and what won't they tell us? And why won't they tell us that? I think just asking questions is enough and, and continuing to ask them and not just taking no for an answer, not allowing a, a people to just sort of brush it off. It's very important because if today people are trying to hide this stuff, this is not historic. Mm -hmm. No one's going to hide something today if they think there are not going to be consequences today over that truth. Yes. And yes. I think people are still alive in very powerful positions with access to children every day who are being protected. And I know that's true in Jersey. Um, it may be true as well in England, but I know for a fact it's true in Jersey. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Leah, an yeah. incredibly yeah. courageous journalist that you are, and, and we applaud you and many congratulations that you at least got your visa back. Um, we'll wait and see what you choose to do with that. Um, in the meantime, please, could you tell people where they can um, find, your, find your work? Sure. Um, I'm going to be allowing people to follow along on some of this. Uh, the most important thing that I've noted in my work is that those who try to stand up alone get utterly trampled. Uh -huh. So the most important thing is, is strength in numbers. So there need to be as many people speaking out and providing even passive support on the internet. Um, so uh, my blog is leahmcgrathgoodman.com, and I'm going to be writing about this as it happens and, co and posting what people have to say. And in addition, my Twitter account is truth eater. It's truth underscore eater um, under my name, Leah McGrath Goodman. And We'll be talking a lot there. You'll also see a lot of the comments from people in Jersey who are Twittering me, mm -hmm. and you'll see how uh, purely vitriolic it can be. Um, but I like to have people be able to speak freely. I don't think anyone should be uh, suppressed. Absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, I'll, I'll post all of that onto my Facebook for anybody who didn't pick up uh, exactly what Leah said there with her Twitter account and her blog. Leah Goodman, uh, Leah Groth Goodman, should I say, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Peppa, and thank you for paying attention to such an important issue. I think our children are the most important thing. Well said. Well, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Leah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.